prayer. Let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word. And open your Bible to 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. We're going to look at verse 15. And move right along into our message this evening. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. <clears throat> it is important that we study... There are a lot of unstudied opinions out there about the King James Bible and about this controversy over versions. We're hoping to address that by offering a studied response to the question, which version should I use? Father, help me to be clear and, um, and of course, Lord God, to communicate your attitude and your heart on on these issues, on this particular subject. It's an important subject. We live by every word that comes from your mouth to us. And we depend upon your scriptures, Lord Jesus. And yet there's been a fundamental shift in the attitude of, of most believers toward the Bible. And we need to return, Lord God, to that simple faith that when we read the Word of God, we are reading, thus saith the Lord. I pray you'll help me with that in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this, I, I picked the wrong jacket. This is a heavy winter coat. I mean, it's like, it, I'm boiling in this thing. Thank you. I think I will. That's a very good suggestion. I believe that I'll take your advice. On that matter, amen. Okay, you picked up the, the cue, good for you. We need to study to show ourselves approved. I think, you know, we're going to give an account for this business. The believers are going to stand before the Lord, and they're going to give an account for all of these things. And when they do, well, it's going to be a pretty sad day for a lot of them, as we'll see as we proceed. Since the beginning of the 20th century, there has been an explosion of English versions of the Bible. It's bewildering and confusing. But when the sincere believer is confronted with the truth, just the simple facts about these new versions, about who are Westcott and Hort, and their influence in the changes that have been perpetrated upon the Christians through these new versions, when they learn about the so-called textual critical apparatus, when they discover the thinking behind much of this, they're appalled and shocked. They wonder, why wasn't I told the truth? I hear that often. Why didn't my pastor ever tell me this? Why? How, how, in fact, they sometimes hear these things and they don't believe it. There's no way. There's no way my pastor wouldn't have told me. I hear that. And so they, they are uh, unwilling to, to believe it. So I encourage you to run down these things and see for yourselves. We proceed with the following basic suppositions. We expect that God kept his word and preserved his words for us for whom they were originally written. We expect, therefore, that the preserved word of God is present and there to be found. We expect there to be many diversions Many substitutes, because that's the devil's way. Many perversions. Many corrupted Bibles. Uh, but that through all of this, it is possible to find the truth because Jesus gave us his spirit who is commissioned to guide us to all truth. The truth is there to be found. The spirit has been given to guide us to it. We expect to be able to find it. We expect also Satan will use powerful seduction to deceive as many as he can to get them away from the true scriptures. It's a weird kind of polarization in the attitude of Christians toward this subject. On this side, there are those who say, well, pick whatever version you want, they're all good. As if the devil wouldn't try to plant a bad version out there. It's just bizarre. Then the other side who's like very suspicious about any version. Well, I, I'm with that crowd. Why? Because I believe the devil would try to give me a corrupted Bible. I believe he would try to do that. In fact, I was warned that he would try to do that. So we expect Satan 
to use those that he can control to give us false Bibles. And uh, so last time we introduced the, the personalities Satan has used to create the confusion. We didn't get to all of them, of course, but I picked the ones that are key players in this farce. And we talked about Philo and Origen of Alexandria. We discussed the Vaticanus, the, and we discussed Tischendorf and his find of the Sinaiticus. We discussed also Westcott and Hort. Other names we, we brought in, I think we mentioned um, Eusebius and a few others. And other names will be coming uh, out also, and we'll talk about this thoroughly. We're going to take our time and just do a thorough job of this. But we said that now we're going to start looking at the theories that seducing spirits spawn in the minds of heretics like these I've named and others in an effort to separate God's people from God's word. So we're going to consider the theories here of Westcott and Hort since they established modern day textual criticism as it is practiced today. They set the standard that virtually all have followed since. Let's give you the backdrop in the early 1800s remember Catholic Jesuits resurfaced the old attack against the King James trying to scandalize King James himself as if he's the one that produced the King James Bible a Protestant king who by the way the Catholics hated with a passion but whom God used to provide an English Bible uh, by commissioning that and supporting those translators so they can do the work that gives us this great King James Bible that has remained the standard for all these years. 350 years it reigned as the Bible until, all, until about the uh, middle of the 1600s. But this began in the 1800s, as I pointed out. And then about midway through the 1800s, we had the discovery of the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, which startled the world and these discoveries were used to stir up God's people first to doubt they had a good Bible. That's the first thing it did. Because they started advertising this idea. Uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus have been, have been found the most ancient manuscripts, the oldest and best. And so now we're going to uh, be able to come back at the Bible, the King James, and we're going to be able to improve it now. So first message that sent is, oh, you mean I didn't have a Bible that I could trust to begin with? So it undermined, generally, the confidence Christians had in their King James Bible. And then right behind that, it created an anticipation for a new and better version. Pretty tricky. And now enter Westcott and Hort toward the end of the 1800s who were tasked with the job. And these are Catholics, by the way. Uh, these Catholic men, Westcott and Hort, they were tasked with the job to create a brand new Greek text from this, these new manuscripts. And it's like the Christian community held its breath waiting. Oh, I can't wait. Oh boy. And nobody ever even stopped to think, what is going on here? What's this about? Well, some did. And they were trying to break through the hypnotism. You know, it's almost as if the Christian community at large was kind of hypnotized by this and got swept away under the influence of that seducing spirit. Uh, there were some strong voices, Dean Bergen and many others whom we'll discuss later on, uh, who spoke out strong against this. And a lot of other uh, independent fundamental Baptists got up and, and really were very concerned about all of this. But a lot of our guys didn't say anything. And we'll talk about that issue later on. Let's get to the theories that Westcott and Hort used to pursue their work. It starts with a new rationale for how we view the Bible. Stuart Custer, who wrote The Truth About the King James Bible Controversy, in his introduction and on page 16 said, and this is not one of our friends, by the way, here's what he said, quote, as much as fundamentalists have loved and defended a great translation like the King James Version, they must remember that the court of last resort in doctrinal matters is not any translation, but the wording of the original Greek and Hebrew texts. The present day believer should read his Bible with the faith that it is God's word, but 
with the humility of recognizing that he may not be able to solve every textual problem that may exist in our Bibles. The believer may safely leave such problems to the discussions of theological and textual experts. He should not try to become a botanist, but simply feed on the fruit of the word. He can let the scholars chew over dry bones. End quote. There is so much rattling of the snake's tail in that statement that it's hard to even know where to start. How absolutely wicked is this statement? It's just, it's terrible. First of all, this guy's never seen an original. That, it's, just, it's just these lies that just get stated so casually in these kind of statements. And, and I'm telling you, it's amazing how many just walk away from it. They don't, they don't think critically. They don't stop and try to think about what's being said. They just take it and go, yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Sure. This challenges the very foundation of our confidence in the Bible. And it does it with such high-sounding words, you know, such a smooth slickster, this guy. So let's pick it apart just briefly. First, <laughs> doctrinal matters don't rest upon any translation, excuse me, but the wording of the original Greek and Hebrew texts. Okay, this guy has never in his life seen an original text. None of them have. This is a lie. Nobody has seen the text Paul wrote. In our day, or in his day, they don't exist. We're looking at copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And we talked about that before, and that doesn't mean there's a problem there. We'll get into that a little bit more in the message this evening. I'm not suggesting that. It's just the, the arrogant assumption this guy as if we've got the originals and we'll study them for you. Do you hear the Catholic Church in that? That's exactly what the Catholics have been saying for years and years and years. They just very reluctantly allow their people lately to start reading their Bible, even their own version. They don't want people reading the Bible. Their spirit has always been this. We'll read it. We'll let you know what it says. That's always been their policy. And only because they've been forced to concede and to give up because of the influence of Protestantism. But anyway, the present day believer should read the Bible with faith that it is God's word. But with the humility of recognizing he may not be able to solve every textual problem that may exist in our Bibles. What are these textual problems that exist in our Bibles? You see how he plants a doubt about your Bible into your head? Oh, i got a bunch of textual problems in here. I wonder where they are. There are no textual problems in here. It goes, it, it just, the whole thing is just, it, it's, it kind of makes me sick to my stomach. The believer may safely leave such problems to the discussions of theological and textual experts. That's the Catholic Church. You're too stupid to understand this stuff. So leave it to us. We'll wrestle with all that stuff. You just read your Bible, be happy with it, and don't worry about it. Man, that's a bad spirit. You know, Bible says, try the spirit to see if it be of God. Uh, that spirit uh, is definitely not of God. And you'll see it even more clearly as we move along tonight. The basic assumption of Westcott and Hort is this. They held the scriptures really can only be understood by Greek and Hebrew scholars. It cannot be understood by anybody who's using a translation. Their fundamental belief is that the work of recovering, that's really what they, that's their, their mindset isn't that we have the preserved word out there, let's go find it. Their mindset, their mindset is, who knows where it's at, we'll, we're the experts, we'll put one together for you. That's their attitude. So the problem is, of course, the Bible is, is, well, we just have a different set of presuppositions about it. We believe it's inspired, we believe it's inerrant, and we believe God preserved it. Their presuppositions are basically that inspiration is limited to the original autographs. Nobody has them, so inspiration's gone. 
Inerrancy, therefore, is impossible, and preservation is limited to what we're able to put back together for you. You see how completely diametrically opposite these positions are? It's a completely different. My, the reason that's important here is because, you understand, that's the ground upon which they approach the task. They approach it from the assumption that, well, that it's the inspiration issue is really moot because the inspiration is limited to original autographs. As far as inerrancy is concerned, not possible. Since there's no inspired text, it's all been messed with. And now, all we have is, all you have is what we can provide for you. All right. Now, this leads them necessarily to the Alexandrian school as opposed to the Antiochian school. This is something we've discussed before. Let's elaborate on this a little bit for the message tonight. There are these two theological schools. You know how you have Harvard and Hillsdale. Right? You understand what I'm saying? So, where are you going to send your kid? Well, you're going to go to Hillsdale, aren't you? See? So, we understand that back in that day, it was Antioch and Alexandria. Antioch was Hillsdale. Alexandria was Harvard. Well, anyway. Not literally, but you know what I mean. The, the, the place you would, if you were a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, you would not trust what was coming to you from Alexandria. You would go to Antioch. Alexandria pioneered the allegorical method of interpretation, the figurative approach. The idea that the message of the Bible does not come from its words. The message of the Bible comes from what happens in you while you read it. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? That God's Word isn't the words. God's Word is what happens inside your head while you're reading the Bible. Uh, it gets crazy. We'll be getting into that some more when we swerve back into the specific topic of this series, which is hermeneutics, the work of interpreting the Bible so as to get God's message from it. But my point is, the school of Alexandria was the liberal theological school of the day. It's where you went to get the nouveau, new way of looking at everything. Whereas if you wanted to go to a good old-fashioned, traditional, believe it the way my papa preached it type school, you would go over to Antioch, you would go into that genre. Antioch stayed with the way Jesus and the apostles handled the scriptures. The literal approach, with a dependence on the words themselves to ascertain the message from them. There's a very fundamental difference here. Alexandria came at it from this allegorical kind of thing where you, it's sort of like a, looking at the Bible is sort of like an abstract piece of art and you kind of look at it and you see whatever you see and God speaks to you. And then you got the Word of God. See? Whereas from the other school, it's like you look at the words, you pay attention to what they said, you're guided by the words to the message God intended you to get. So you have the attitude Jesus had when he made the argument with the Sadducees concerning the resurrection and base his argument, as you've heard me say often, on the tense of a single verb. In many other places, we see uh, examples of the apostles and Jesus Christ handling the scriptures literally. That tradition shows up in the Antioch school, the Egyptian allegorical system of interpreting the gods shows up in the Alexandrian school, and literally what they were doing, they were taking the system concocted by the priests to save their Iliad and Homer and all that stuff from being completely repudiated. So they invented this allegorical way of interpreting them to keep them relevant and alive. That's what they did. So Origen and some others come along and they want to use those methods to interpret the Bible. That's just a mess. This is... Uh, further reflected in the attitude toward lay people reading their Bible. Alexandria, you know, leave it to the pros. Antioch, open the Bible and read it for yourself. I'm going to say some things that are going to surprise you, so keep up with this. And so, Westcott and Hort think there wasn't any kind of Bible for Christians to read. I dare say if I asked and hands went up, many of you would say, that your, your idea in your mind about the situation Christians had back then is 
They didn't really have a Bible like we do. They couldn't go home and read their Bible. A lot of Christians believe that. It's a lie. Believers had Bibles back then. I, it's, anyway, let me prove it to you. Here we go. First of all, in the book of Acts, chapter number 17, verses 10 to 13, the Bible says that Paul would preach. And what did the good Bereans do? They went home and read their Bibles to see if what Paul said was so. Where did they get a Bible? Thought they didn't have one. See, it's a myth. It's a lie that we've accepted just like, oh, but pay attention. According to the Bible, those people at Berea could go home and check from the Scriptures what it was that Paul had preached. When Jesus walked into the synagogue, they brought him the Scripture. Every single synagogue had a copy of the Bible. There were lots of copies of the Bible available to believers back then. Clement, he's a fellow that, write, that wrote a letter to the Corinthian church in A.D. 96. Now that's right around the time John the Apostle wrote his book, Revelation, and about the time that John dies here in a couple of years. So my, see how early it is? We had, we had an apostle still alive at this time, and a Christian named Clement wrote an epistle to the Corinthian people. He quoted, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, he quoted eight New Testament books. But they didn't have a Bible. I thought you, you couldn't just quote, you, you didn't have it. You couldn't. So what did he do? He traveled to eight different places? Does anybody here for one minute think that believers back then were so indolent and careless about the Bible, they didn't jump all over getting a copy? Of course they did. One of the most active things going on in the early churches was making copies of the letters of the, of the apostles. That was a big deal. And does anybody think, oh, they didn't care about it being, they didn't care about it being correct. And they just did a little job. And, right? I mean, the, the thinking that, that goes on is crazy to me. Look, if I lived back then and I had a chance to take the letter to Rome, the Romans, and, and make a copy so I can take it and then give it to others, I would be careful. I would try to do as good a job as I could possibly do and have it checked over and over and over again by some others, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Now there's a guy named Chrysostom of the Antioch school, by the way, who encouraged his flock. Listen to this, quote, every man should read by himself at home in the mean days and time. Now that's language that sounds weird to us, but that means in between sermons. When you hear a message, before you hear the next one, you should go home and read the scripture. That's what he's saying. That when they were at home in their houses, they should apply themselves from time to time to the reading of the holy scriptures. I thought they didn't have one. But you have a pastor Chrysostom telling his flock, hey, you guys, go home and read your Bibles. He didn't say, I know it's a long trip to Rome, but if you want to read Paul's letter to the Romans, you can, you, you ought to just get on the boat and take off. Then after you stop there at Rome and read Romans, then get back in your boat and go over to Thessalonica and see if you can find that. That's not the way it was. I mean, in the very beginning it was. But by the time we get 20, 30, 40 years into this, Christians had already, amazing, somebody thought about Getting copies. You get, what I'm, you get what I'm trying to get at here? Like, duh! Of course they did. This is going to an important point, so hang on. What were they reading in Acts 17? What were they reading in A.D. 347, 407? What were they reading in A.D. 96? Polycarp, a disciple of John, the, the apostle, had a Bible. 
and he charged any who would copy it to be faithful. He said, quote, Whosoever perverts the oracles of the Lord, he is the firstborn of Satan. Now, the reason that's important is because what it means is two things. One, this guy had a Bible, and two, people were making copies of it. And he was challenging them. You, you take this seriously. Anybody who, who perverts the oracles of the Lord, he's the firstborn son of Satan. Irenaeus sat under John the Apostle, was discipled by Polycarp. Did these names mean anything to you? Okay, good. <clears throat> he acknowledged the existence of an authoritative copy of the inspired scriptures. He said, quote, I adjure you who shall copy out this book by our Lord Jesus Christ and by his glorious advent when he comes to judge the living and the dead that you compare what you transcribe and correct it carefully against this manuscript from which you copy and also that you transcribe this adjuration and insert it in the copy. The believers were busy making copies. They had scriptures. Now they had a lot more copies of the Old Testament than they did the New. But by the time we get into the 3rd and 4th century here, it was not uncommon for a home to have a copy of the Bible. Now There was a Greek Bible of the Antiochian school back then. Yeah, that's the point I'm making. You betcha. It was called the Byzantine text, which we today call the Antiochian text. There was already a great deal of activity of putting together all these letters written by the apostles and the gospels and pulling them together so Christians could have the writings of the apostles. That was already going on. All right, these Christians had access to the originals. That's really awesome. We're talking about the originals, the originals, the originals. Well, the people who had access to the originals are the ones who were making these copies. And so they're found in the Antiochian area. They're found over in Greece. They're in Corinth. They're found in Rome. They're found um, in, uh, in, in Thracia. They're found in the area we call Asia Minor. They're, they're found over in Antioch itself and that little strip of Jerusalem, or not Jerusalem, but Israel, up through there. They're found in that area, and these manuscripts were called the Byzantine manuscripts. Later they became called the Antiochian manuscripts for reasons I explained earlier, the polarization of these two schools of thought. That's what, that's what happened there. Uh, the Antioch school took the Byzantine text as their foundation for Scripture. The Alexandrian school took Origen's work and others like that, and they organized their school around that textual base. So that's what happened. So these Christians had access to, to the originals. In Tertullian's day, Tertullian could say this, Come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity. He's challenging heretics. Here's what he's saying. If you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over the apostolic churches to which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent in their places, in which their own authentic writings are read. And he sent them to those places whom, uh, to whom the letters were originally addressed or copies were. So in other words, if you have a question about the copy you're reading, you can go today over there and compare it to the one that's there. You see, they had the originals in their time. They were still there. Nobody threw those things away. Now, over time, they were used and used and used, and they had to make faithful copies, of course. But, nevertheless, in that early, here's what I'm trying to get at. The early Christians had a Bible. These factors provided for an early creation of a textus receptus as early as the 4th century. That's huge. It isn't the case that nobody had a Bible. And there was this Sinaiticus and this Vaticanus over here lost. And nobody had a Bible there in the 4th century. And then one day somebody found the Sinaiticus. Oh, look, a 4th century Bible. 
fourth century Christians already had a Bible. Amen? That's really important. Because they get, the way they word this and the way they present themselves, you would almost get the impression that the fourth century Christians didn't have a Bible. But they did, for heaven's sake. They quoted from it. And by Texas Receptus, we mean the text that was received by the Bible-believing Christians. That's what Textus Receptus means. The received text. There was already in place a copy of the original scriptures that was being used by Christians, that was received by Christians as a faithful representation of what the original autographs said. They already had that. And of course they would. And not one time was any original or copy of an original sent to Egypt. Never happened. That's important to understand. The guys in Egypt concocted a textual thing. I mean, Origen comes along, and we'll get into him some more later on. He comes along, he literally creates this thing. So we'll get into that some more later on, but anyway. The theory then, when we compare the Texas Receptus that we use today, oh, we need to get a load of this. When we take what we call the Texas Receptus today and we, care, we compare it with the Byzantine text, the degree of agreement between the manuscripts is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It's near miraculous how well it's been preserved. 100% of the manuscripts agree with 80% of the text. By the way, when I'm, the work I'm doing right now, there's these numbers I'm going to throw at you, like this morning, it might make you start thinking, yikes. Okay. But anyway, these numbers are actually very meaningful. I won't take the time I would need to to kind of explain fully, but if you want that, we can talk later on. <laughs> but I'm going to throw it out there. But remember, it's including all of the manuscripts in the Byzantine manuscript family, all of them. And there are some bad ones in there. There are some that are, that are aberrant. There are some little red herrings and little junk that gets in there, and you have to sift that out. And there's a process that you use to do it. But when you find out how small amount of that there is, it's shocking. And it's not hard to find. In other words, one, one guy I read who's an expert in all this stuff, he said the areas where there's an aberration are obvious and they show up like one time in 5,000 pieces of manuscript evidence. This aberration shows up once. And that's like pretty sure that's a pretty sure signal that it isn't part of the original because it all of a sudden pops up and doesn't agree with 90% of the others. You get what I'm trying to say? It, the, the, what God did uh, well, is just wonderful. 100% of the manuscripts agree with 80% of the text. 99% agree to another 10%. Over 95% agree with 4%. 90% agree with another 3%. Only 3% or less of the text do fewer than 90% of the manuscripts agree. <laughs> I know what that sounds like to you. It's like, yeah, I might as well have been speaking Spanish. I can't speak uh, to those of you who don't know the language. I, I get it. But basically what they're saying is the amount of variation in the manuscript evidence that we use to support what we call the TR, the Texas Receptus, the amount of variation in that manuscript evidence is miraculously little. It's amazing how little difference, how, many, how little variation there is from one, one manuscript to the next. And here's the idea. If you have an original, and from that original you have a multitude of copies. Let's say, let, just I throw numbers out to kind of give some sense of this. You have, let's say, one original and 500 copies. 
for those 500 copies to agree almost to the point of like this comes down to something like only a 3% variation. If there's only 3% variation, the variations aren't hard to find, are they? You hear what I'm saying? You see, if, I, if I've got 500 copies of this one, and, and then I lost that one, let's just say, and all I've got are the 500 copies, I'm looking at these 500 copies, and, you know, 80% of it, you get this little 3% over here, this one, and then this one, and then a little bit of this one has something that doesn't seem like it fits the rest of them. But all the rest of them testify to what needs to be said. You follow what I'm saying? It's not hard. If you had great wide variations and just amazing differences, then you would know that people are making it up as they go along. But when you have such a narrow margin of little wobble room there, you don't, you've obviously got some real faithful copies here, and it isn't hard to, to work through which ones are the, most, are the closest to the original or are the original. And you come down family after family, and watch. You get another tradition, another one, another one, another one, another one. You get down over here where you got 5,000 different pieces, bits, and all that kind of stuff, and you start looking at them, and they agree to within 3% or better. You've got to be going, Wow. That's amazing. And when you have that little bit of variation, it isn't hard to figure out where the aberrations are. It's obvious. Why? Well, because if, if I have a reading here and then here and then here and then here, a long genealogy. You get what I'm trying to say by genealogy? In other words, here's the original, and, and it has, let's say, children, if you will. I mean, you know, copies and then copies, and then copies, and then copies. And I see a certain reading on a certain verse show up here, and here, and here, 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 here. If it has a long family line, then I know it's linked back to the original. You get what I mean? That's how that works. This is how this work is done, by the way. And that's how our Texas Receptus was put together, from that kind of thinking. That was the theory behind that work. <laughs> okay, so uh, the places of divergence are, are so extreme when they are off that it's like that's obviously something that doesn't fit here. The harmony of the manuscripts underlying the TR is amazing to the point of miraculous, and others have testified to that. Westcott and Hort had to concede this truth. I want to hurry to my point and be done in about five or ten minutes. A theoretical, uh, Hort says this, quote, a theoretical presumption indeed remains that a majority of extant documents is more likely to represent a majority of ancestral documents at each state of transmission than vice versa. I know. That's the problem with going into this. I told you, it's going to be kind of weird because they, uh, so let me translate that for you. Basically, what he's saying is what I just said. All right? If you have copies of copies of copies and there's a long genealogy connecting the, the line of thinking on these words and this reading and that reading, then it's more than likely connected to the original. That's what he's saying. In other words, he's agreeing with what I said a moment ago. Hort further admitted, quote, the fundamental text of the late extant Greek manuscripts generally is beyond all question identical with the dominant Antiochian or Greco-Syrian text of the second half of the fourth century. Now, this is an amazing thing. They're talking about a 4th century. They, they are admitting that there was extant in the 4th century a Bible that is virtually identical to the one you guys call the Texas Receptus today. Yeah. They admit that. Why? You can't not admit it. The evidence is overwhelming. So what do they do about it? They came up with something called the Lucian Recension Theory. Let me explain it briefly. We're going to go into it. It's going to be the message next, next time. We'll talk about the Lucian Recension Theory. It's a, it's a total lie. It was absolutely made up. Made up! There's no record in history of any council directed by or coordinated by a guy named Lucian where they concocted this Syrian manuscript. But basically what they're saying is there was this empire-wide church council 
that was called and they picked when I say they picked a date I mean that Westcott and Hort picked a date they said ah, it happened somewhere between 80 250 and 350 and it happened at Antioch and they picked uh, this guy Lucian is the guy who coordinated coordinated this council and then they gave this thing a technical sounding name the Lucian recension how do they explain the existence of a 4th century TR or received text that believers used in the 4th century that agrees today with the TR we use today, the, text, the, you know, the, the uh, received text that we have today? How do they explain it? They invent a council that never happened. They claim these men got, to, these men got together and created the Antiochian manuscript. That's how they do it. They say, oh, well some... Guys got together who didn't like the Alexandrian school and suppressed the Alexandrian documents and insisted they're no good and we're only going to use these. So they created this thing called the Byzantine text or the 4th century TR. It's amazing. Here's the problem with it. There's no historical validity to the claim. None. My head wants to explode when I look at this kind of stuff. I'm, what I'm trying to tell you right now, you go to any history book you want to, look for the Lucian Convention or whatever you want to call it. It's not there. It is a theory. Westcott and Hort want to create a new textual base for new versions. They don't want to use the textual base of the old version, the King James Bible. They want to create a new one. They have been saying, fourth century, wow, we've got the oldest and best. But smart guys like Dean Bergen and some others come along and say, what are you talking about? Look at all this evidence of a fourth century TR. Westcott and Hort have got to figure that out. Well, how are we going to respond to that? Oh, they created it in the 4th century. You and I have lived in this environment long enough to know that when a certain group starts blaming you for something, they're doing it. Am I right? We've seen that over and over and over. In other words, that's exactly what they were doing. Creating a, a manuscript. So you just said, well, that's what they did back then. And do you begin to see then the, the, de the debate between these schools of thought, the Alexandrian versus the Antiochian? It's an old, old argument. And then not content with one make-believe council, they inflated their lie because the devil knows the bigger the lie, the harder it is to deny. Do you know that? Yeah. Hitler's Goebbels came up with that one. If you're going to lie, lie big. The big lies are harder to, to ignore and harder to uh, refute. An authoritative revision at Antioch, they say, took place and so on. So I've got I to conclude here. Their proof is this. Since there's no TR that we can find before the 4th century, but wait, but wait a minute. The manuscripts they're using to support their new one our 4th century. There aren't any of those before the 4th century either. And yet we actually have evidence that believers, as I already, I already went through the evidence, we have evidence that believers were copying and using Bibles before we even get to the 4th century. And so, anyway, hopefully this is helpful. Please tell me it is. All right, because if it isn't, we'll do something different, but I think it's helpful. What you learned tonight is that, surprise, surprise, Christians read their Bibles. Christians cared about having a Bible. Christians actually thought, hey, this might be a good idea. Let's go get copies of the book of Romans. Let's go get copies of Thessalonians. Let's put them together so people can have the Bible. What, a, what an amazing thing for some Christian to think of doing. It was being done right along. Let's stand together, please.
All of that is hopefully to make the point that the text that stands under the King James Bible, which we call the Texas Receptus, which you'll learn more about as we proceed, is a firm foundation for our Bible. A very good, solid foundation for our Bible. And thank God for that. We have a more sure word for sure. Let's thank God for it. That's, your, that's the invitation. Let's just thank God for the Bible that we have. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to have a sure word.